So, as of the last tutorial, we've come up against some of the limitations of push constants, namely the limited space. For more complicated shaders, we would like to be able to provide more data. To do so, we will use a uniform buffer. A uniform buffer is a way to provide arbitrary read-only data to our shaders, just like we've done so far with push constants. However, uniform buffers can be much larger. The minimum size specified by Vulkan is 16 kilobytes. Some mobile devices will use this limit. Desktop-based devices will more commonly have 64 kilobytes available. But uniform buffers are not strictly better than push constants though. Reading from uniform buffer memory can be slightly slower, they require additional setup on our end, and require binding before a draw call is made, which can also introduce additional overhead. If you recall, we actually already have some experience working with Vulkan buffer objects. When sending a model's attribute data, we used a vertex buffer to store the per vertex information. A VK buffer is the same object type used for uniform data as well, with the only difference being the buffer usage flag. So before we create a buffer with uniform data, I think now is a good time to create an abstraction for Vulkan buffer objects. I've gone ahead and done this, and have put a pastebin link to the code in the description below. Copy and paste the code into your project and rename the class and namespace to match your project conventions. I'm not going to go through all of this code line by line, because it's pretty self-explanatory. It simply wraps a VK buffer and VK buffer memory into a single object. It provides functions to apply common operations to buffers, such as mapping memory, writing to the device memory from the host, and so on. I've also included indexed variants for each operation. These are useful for grouping multiple instances into a single buffer, rather than using a buffer per instance. Finally, we have some getter functions for the private member variables. One thing though that's a bit less self-explanatory is the min offset alignment field. Similar to how fields within a push constant or uniform object need to follow certain padding guidelines, instances of a uniform block must be at an offset that is an integer multiple of the min uniform buffer offset alignment device value. For this reason, I've included a helper function that takes an instance size and the min offset alignment, and returns the smallest size in bytes that satisfies this requirement. Okay, that might have all been a bit confusing. So for example, if an instance of a uniform buffer object is 19 bytes, and the minimum offset alignment for uniforms is 16 bytes for your device, then to pack multiple uniforms into a single buffer object, we need to have an additional 13 bytes of padding. So in that case, the instance size will be 19 bytes, and the alignment size will be 32 bytes, the smallest integer multiple of 16 that fits an instance. Vertex and index buffers do not have an alignment requirement, so we can use the default value of 1, but for objects like storage and uniform buffers, this is required to be properly set. Okay, now before creating a uniform buffer, let's refactor the model class to use this new abstraction. In the model header, I'll include LVE buffer and then scroll down to the bottom of the file to change from using separate buffer and device memory handles to instead using a unique pointer of type LVE buffer called vertex buffer. Similarly, I'll also update the buffer and device handles for the index buffer to use a unique pointer of type LVE buffer. Then in the model implementation file, start by removing the contents of the destructor. We no longer need to manually destroy the buffer and free the device memory, because the LVE buffer class will now handle cleaning up buffer resources automatically for us. Okay, next, we need to modify the create vertex and index buffer functions to instead initialize an LVE buffer instance. The buffer constructor is pretty similar to the create buffer function, except instead of taking the buffer size directly, it takes separate instance count and instance size arguments. The buffer size is then calculated within the buffer class by first calculating the alignment size and then using the alignment size times the instance count. I'm going to create a new variable of type uint32 called vertex size equal to the size of vertices at index 0. Remember that device local memory should be faster but is unable to be accessed from the CPU. So we use a staging buffer as a temporary location to copy data on the CPU to the GPU and then transfer the data from the staging buffer to the optimal device local memory. 
So create an LVE buffer staging buffer, initialize with the device, vertex size, vertex count, and then the same buffer usage flags and memory property flags as used below. And then you can remove the prior declaration for the staging buffer. Okay, so the LVE buffer class has functionality to make mapping memory and writing to the buffer a bit simpler. We can map the entire buffer memory region by calling staging buffer dot map. Then we write our vertex data to the buffer with staging buffer dot write to buffer with vertices dot data. But make sure to first cast vertices dot data to a void pointer. This replaces the functionality of the four lines below, so we can now remove them. We also don't need to worry about unmapping the memory by calling staging buffer dot unmap, since that will be handled automatically when the staging buffer is cleaned up. Now we can initialize the vertex buffer, which is a unique pointer, so set vertex buffer is equal to std make unique LVE buffer with the device vertex size vertex count and the same usage and memory flags as used below. So vertex buffer bit or transfer destination bit as the usage flags and device local bit for the memory property flags. We can use the same copy buffer command to transfer from the staging buffer to the vertex buffer. We just need to provide the underlying buffer handles. Finally, remove the last two lines cleaning up the staging buffer. The staging buffer is a stack variable, so it will be automatically cleaned up for us when the create vertex buffer function ends. Okay, now we pretty much have to do this exact same thing for the create index buffers function. Just below the buffer size initialization, initialize an index size variable. Then create a staging buffer, call dot map, and write indices.data to the buffer. Initialize index buffer with a make unique function call. If you're copying and pasting from above, make sure you have the correct buffer usage and memory property flags. And then finally update the copy buffer function arguments and remove the last two lines cleaning up the staging buffer. The only remaining thing to do is fix the bind model function. We need to provide the underlying Vulkan buffer handles. So this becomes vertex buffer arrow get buffer and index buffer arrow get buffer. And that's it. Now is a good time to test your code to make sure everything is working the same as before. If I build and run, I can see my two vase objects, move the camera around and resize the window with no issue. Okay, now that we've got that bit of refactoring out of the way, let's create a uniform buffer. We'll do this in the app implementation file. First include the LVE buffer header, then just within my namespace, I'll declare a struct called global UBO with fields GLM map for projection view initialized to the identity matrix and a GLM vec3 field called light direction and initialize that to GLM normalize GLM vec3 of one negative three and negative one. This struct is going to serve a similar purpose as the simple push constant data struct. We're going to use it as a way to pass in read-only data to the pipeline shaders. Now at the start of the run function, let's create a uniform buffer. The arguments are the device, the instance size and instance count, and the buffer usage and memory flags. I use an instance count equal to the max frames in flight which is the value that dictates how many frames can be submitted for rendering simultaneously. This way we can safely write to a frames UBO instance without having to worry about the possible synchronization issues. So for example, frame zero could write to UBO zero, record its command buffer and submit for rendering. And then frame one can write to UBO one, even if frame zero is still rendering and reading from UBO zero. So by having two copies of the UBO, we never need to introduce extra weighting or synchronization. Double buffering like this should be used whenever you have a dynamic resource that is written to each frame. Next, since this is a uniform buffer that will contain multiple instances, we need to specify the min offset alignment. We can find this value in the device.properties.limits struct. Finally, note that we are not using the device coherent memory flag. 
This is because we want to selectively flush parts of the buffer in order to not interfere with the previous frame that may still be rendering. Okay, now moving on, now that we have successfully created a buffer, we need to call map on the buffer to enable writing to its memory. Next, each frame we need to update the buffer's data. So just below, in the if block where we begin a frame, we're going to have uh, two distinct phases. The first phase is where we will prepare and update objects and memory, followed by a second phase where our draw calls will be recorded. I declare a local frame index variable for convenience, and then declare a global UBO instance and set the projection view field to camera.projection times camera.getView. Next, I will write this global UBO data to my buffer object using the write to index command, where the index is the frame index. Finally, because we did not use the host coherent memory flag, I now need to manually flush the memory at frame index to the GPU. If you build and run, things should work just as before, but we haven't actually changed anything. Each frame we update the uniform buffer, but that data is actually never used within our shaders yet. We need to tell the pipeline object where this buffer is and how the data within it is structured. To do so, Vulkan uses descriptor sets an additional layer of abstraction. This is what will be covered in next week's tutorial. Before ending this video, I'd like to do one more thing. Currently, if we want something like render systems to have access to external information, we pass in each field individually. This can make things pretty tedious if we ever want to change what data is provided. We would have to update the function signatures and every single function call. So let's create a new header file called LVE frame info containing a frame info struct. This will wrap all frame relevant data into a single object, which then can easily be provided to any systems function calls. For now, all we have is the frame index, time, command buffer, and camera state. In the future, we will be adding more onto this. Then in the simple render system header, include the frame info header and update the render game objects function to now just take two arguments, a reference to the frame info and the vector of game objects. Next in the render systems implementation file, let's update the function signature to match and then change the four occurrences of command buffer to use frame info.command buffer and the two occurrences of camera to be frame info dot camera. Okay, cool. So the last thing to do is prepare the frame info each frame. So at the start of the begin frame if block in our app implementation, add frame info frame info, initialize with the frame index, the frame time, command buffer, and camera. Finally, update the render game objects function call with the new arguments, build and run, and everything should be the same as before. Sorry for not the most exciting tutorial today. Uniforms and descriptor sets just require a bit of initial setup before becoming useful. Anyway, thanks for watching. Hope you're looking forward to the next tutorial and keep on coding. Cheers.